Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Day. Hi, this is episode 60 of our beekeeping podcast here in New Zealand. And this week we are talking about bumblebees, Monsanto, and how do honeybees smell? Pretty good. Yeah. And we're in the swinging 60s now, and we're moving into Christmas time, and there's a lot of love in the air. A lot of love, and finger painting's cool. Yeah, man. Far out. Far out, man. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Well, welcome to the Kiwi Mana Buzz. It's Gary and Margaret here. And we are beekeepers from the hills of the Waitaki Ranges in West Auckland, New Zealand. In the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, and we're not part of Australia. No. And our podcast is about beekeeping, gardening, and political issues about environmental issues, and we also have been known to go off on tangents about issues sometimes. Yes, I love to have a rant and rave at times, you know, just to to keep it interesting, because we think that within beekeeping, there's a lot of facets that create a lot of conflict for us as beekeepers in terms of how people... Um, manage their land, but we'll go into that a bit further on. Absolutely. So. And the uh, show notes for this podcast are kiwimana.co.nz slash 60. And we'd just like to take this time to thank you guys for listening to our show this year. And for this, if you it's your first time listening, thank you. Thanks for coming along and listening to our show. Yeah, and we'd like to really thank all our customers and our listeners and those who email us with all their questions. And, you know, we do this for you, we hope that this podcast gives you some value and that you enjoy it just as much as we enjoy doing it for you. So enjoy and thank you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we just have a rundown of what we've been up to. And first of all, it's me. And I uh, spoke. Go, Gary. <laughs> Far out, man. <laughs> What's been in the we, groove? In the groove? Well, I sprained my hand, didn't I? That wasn't um, groovy. No, I did that with uh, spraying the tendons in my hand. With I, we think it was frame building. Yeah, I think it's the the tension for wiring up the frames. So that's yep, not absolutely. good. Absolutely, and we've both had uh, food poisoning. So that was bad. We suspect where we got it from, but we won't say here. But if you want to know, give us a call. Anyway. <laughs> Classified information. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we've been picking up swarms, as we talked about in the last podcast, and they're all looking pretty good. One one looks like it's got a laying worker, and I've written here, or oh, a wholesome queen, so the queen that's not being mated. Oh, I see. So, so you're saying that she might be a virgin. I think so, or either that or she's a, a laying worker. So we'll have to recheck that one this weekend if the weather's good, and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, you'll be finding a whole lot of drones if if she isn't mated. Yeah, it was a pretty funny hive because it also had a lot of um, sack brood in it, which is quite weird. And, you know, a lot of people mistake sack brood for or American fowl brood, but they're totally different. Yeah, you have to be pretty up on it. And, you you, you know, that's part of what we do here at Kiwi Mana is we encourage people to be to become, you know, really aware of what's normal in a hive because then once you start, understanding what's normal and healthy in your cells and and everything to do with your bee activity and everything, then you will be able to spot things like sac brood and know it's different from AFB. Yeah, absolutely. But I I think that hive we're probably going to have to... um, I've got another nuke there that's going really well, so what I might do is is add that queen to that hive and then uh, we'll have to, you know, we'll have to take all the work of all the all the bees and shake them out about 100 metres away. Is it, do you really want to combine a sack brood hive with a good working hive? Um, I'm going to take all our old frames out and just put new frames in, but just keep some of the worker, the, the field bees. Yeah, you're right, I'm not going to leave that comb in there. I'm going to put new comb in. Okie dokie. And so what's we'll this, um, field bees. what's all this about... Using sheep tags. What's that all about? Sheep tags for the hives. Cause, because probably me, more than other people, I get confused about which hive is what, um, unless we look at a map. But what I've got is I've got some, you can get these sheep tags that you tag your, your sheep's ears with, which we don't have any sheep, so we don't need them for that. But we've bought some, and we've just written the number with a um, with a marker on it, 
and we've I've actually screwed that to the front of the hive, so you can actually see which hive instantly is is the uh, which number is matches which name of the hive. So Gary's going to be doing that in your uh, quarantine apiary, aren't you? Yep, absolutely, and it's um it's screwed onto the front of the mesh board or the or the you know the bottom board. So that's uh, yeah, it seems it seems to work pretty well, and I've. Uh, Done that, and you've got we've got bright orange ones, didn't we, Margaret? Yeah, them favourite colour. Yeah, that's that's the uh, Kiwi Mana orange colour, and that's pretty good. Well, so we'll keep an, keep an eye on those ones. Yeah, they're doing really well, and there's one there that's just majorly going um, great guns and got lots of honey. So Gary's happy about that, so he can feed his addiction over winter. I've have run out of honey. It's very sad. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm very upset about it. No, I'm it's, just it's, it's all right, Dale. It's all right. Just, it's <laughs> no. okay. And what else have we done? We've we've moved the Kiwi Mana website to a different, more reliable. We hope host seems to be going really well. Uh, we had trouble with the other one, keeping yeah, timing out and yeah. causing issues. It just t- t- took so long to log in and do any maintenance work and and we know that opening for the online shop it was just a pain and yeah. so we hope that this is um something this upgrade will will really serve the customers well as well so yeah um, so uh, if, if you had any trouble in the past give it another go and see what you think and I just want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas to you and your family because it's coming up to Christmas in, the, yes. in a few weeks. And if you celebrate Christmas, um, get out there and visit your family. And, yeah, absolutely. We, we, uh, we'll, we'll be getting together with our family, won't we? So it'll yeah. be good. Yeah, well, we, we just wish you well in the festive season and the new coming up celebrations for another a year in the Euro- is it European or Western Western calendar. And just awesome. Yeah, so, absolutely. And yeah. If, you, if you're in the uh, Southern Hemisphere and you're going away for summer, have a safe and cool trip. And don't forget to make sure that your bees are uh, all in place and they're protected before you go. Yeah, and maybe even add a couple of supers. Yeah, and also don't forget to take your honey off before the end of December. That's right, because in New Zealand we have a thing called tutin, which is a, um, a toxic plant, which happens after Christmas generally. It's actually, it's called the tutu bush, and the toxin that you're talking about is called tutin. Yeah, absolutely. So if you can you can Google that and find out some information. Yeah. And the other thing, if you're heading off on a long trip, what's really important to do? To to uh, load up your phone or your iPad with all the podcasts from the That's Kiwi right. Mana. I mean, you will have entertainment for hours and hours and hours <laughs> and hours, and you will love it. For the whole family. The whole family. So, hi, kids out there. Hope you're enjoying the show. Oh, just be careful that there may be some expletives in there. That uh... No, no, they won't be. Oh, they won't be. Oh, that's all right then. We're a family show here. <laughs> so, what have you been up to, Margaret? Well, I have been very sick. I have been suffering from, as you say, the food poisoning. And, man, that was just knocked us for six. And I just am just starting to it's been about 10 days now and I'm just starting to feel a bit better so yeah that really took it out of me and uh, it's a horrible thing to have but yeah coming out the other side now so to speak (laughs) yeah absolutely uh, we both lost a lot of weight so you won't recognize us (laughs) yeah well I'm putting weight back on I just got so dehydrated but anyway anyway moving along we won't talk about that yeah the next thing is um yeah we've been because this time of the year in New Zealand, we have to do our AFB recognition and fill out the forms, which they call a DECA certification, which is Disease Elimination Conformity Agreement that all beekeepers in New Zealand get when they register their apiaries. And we've been, you know, as part of our beekeeper services, we go out and we inspect hives for our beekeepers that you know don't just don't have time to go and do the studies for it and it's a wonderful service and we get to see a lot of people's um, apiaries and how their colonies are going and yeah basically just really good to 
go and see what's going on and signing off on those healthy ones and hopefully never find any that are not healthy. But uh, we've only had one this year, which has been um, had AFB. So we've um, that was very sad, but, you know, You've got to get back up on the horse and get another colony and just get back into it again. Absolutely. And you've been doing some customer inspections as well? Yes, I've been working with a few customers on some projects to capture some of the genetics that we sold um, last year. And, you know, basically part of servicing those customers, we've been able to get some splits. So that's been really good and... Yeah, helping out with them so they don't lose their colonies um, to too many swarms. So some of them have swarmed several times already and, wow, it's just been amazing. So just keeping an eye on that and, yeah, just the regular customer inspections for those who who have are a bit time poor because they work so hard. So, yeah, it's been good. Yeah, absolutely. And... Um yeah, the next next article is a bit. We've got a bit of sad news, haven't we? One of the earliest contacts we had when we first started beekeeping was with a lady called Rosemary, and we met Rosemary at the Auckland Bee Club, and she's just such an interesting person, and we had good conversations with her about um, beekeeping, and she just loves her bees so. We decided right at the beginning that we would get some bees off her and um, so we went to her property and she showed us her bees and wow, she just loved them and uh, she was so helpful to us and she gave us a bit of mentoring support and yeah, we really enjoyed contact with her and uh, yeah, she even came and visited our apri and gave us some advice. But she passed away and I think it's, you know, very sad that she's passed but I know that she would have been doing what she loved so, you know. And when she was at the Auckland Bee Club she used to make all the teas and, yeah, so. Yeah, she was always full of advice and some good ideas, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, she was very helpful and uh, yeah, we'll miss her greatly and her cups of tea and we just want to say thank you, Rosemary. Yeah, and thank you. Yep. You've been doing busy with the apiary as well? Yeah, we've had, because generally what we do, because we do things, we try to do things organically, we don't spray or anything like that, so we let the lawns grow so that the bees have, you know, a bit of varied food around and, yeah, I've been getting that, um, cutting down the areas where... There's a lot of lawn growing and we're getting in preparation for our new colonies, which unfortunately this year are really, really late. Um, We've had news from all over New Zealand um, where the queens are taking a long time to develop and uh, become mated. And if it takes too long for the queen to mate, generally you get a failed queen, so... It's been really tough out there trying to get uh, colonies going. Um, that's what we've heard, and we've just done our splits two weeks ago, so we were still waiting patiently to see how they will cope. Yeah, basically, it's been tough. We've had so much rain. The apiary is soaked. Um, it's really muddy out there. So, uh, yeah, it's been pretty tough, eh? <laughs> Yeah, it has. It's been a bit tough on the old bees. So hopefully we're in. But today's been fantastic, isn't it? We went to visit one of um, our customers' apiaries and it was... I, Margaret was moving some um, bees into a, into a main box and I was just yep. sitting there watching the sun. So it, it was, was awesome. just it was just lovely and it's amazing because I went there yesterday as well because what they were doing was on the, under the bottom of the mesh board they had started to do crazy comb and so we think that maybe the queen had gone out because it was a new queen had gone out and mated and then come back and just maybe the weather was bad or something and she was they were underneath the mesh board 
and they started creating a colony under there. So we had to go through and cut out the all the comb that they put in there and we got rubber bands and we put them onto frames and, yeah, it, we, it worked out pretty good. We just hoped that we didn't kill the queen because it was really, really hard to get in there to get her. So we had to kind of do it um, strip by strip. So, um, yeah, that'll be interesting to see if we've managed to keep her alive. So that's hopeful. So we did that. And um, we checked the other hive that was there and the we had put a queen excluder in so that the new queen that, that was placed in there from some cells that had hatched, um, we just needed to make sure she was going to lay. But in doing so, the brood above, there was a lot of drones in there and they were kind of trapped in the top part of the hive. So when I opened the top, all these drones flew away. So it was a real big noisy buzz. But um, yeah, it's looking good, but we still need to have a bit of patience with the laying of the queen because we have had about four days of bad weather and lots and lots of wind. So that's the kind of thing I've been up to lately. Wow, busy. Yeah, and building gear and helping people out with all their questions about failed queens. Yeah, so, we have had a lot of inquiries about do we sell queens, and we, we don't, so we've been yeah. passing them on to uh, Dell's pollination, haven't we? Yeah, I think the thing that I say to people is that a lot of the questions are coming from beginner beekeepers, and even older beekeepers, I think it's really important to notice that it can take up to 40 days for a queen to be right or queen right as it's often termed and the reason is is because if you think about it the hive is losing if you if you leave the hive to swarm then you are creating a situation where that colony is going to basically be split in half and so it's just you've just got to be aware that when the colony does that, it is going to decrease in activity. They're going to take time out to raise the queen, and a queen cell takes 16 days to hatch. Then you've got 10 to 12 days for mating, and mating does not occur in the hive with the drones because those are the queen's offspring. So they, all queens, leave the hive and they go on a mating flight Mm. and they create new genetics by doing so and that's why bees are surviving and that's the response that I've given to one of the inquiries that I've had. But, you know, from that 16 days in 10 to 12 days to mate, then you've got, that's 28 days. So then you've got another 9 to 12 days, you know, depending on if the weather's been good, on top of that, so you are looking around 40 days to be absolutely sure because by the time that brood is capped, that's sort of timing that you're looking at. So you've got to understand that the colony is going to be closing down a bit. It's going to be a bit more vulnerable, so you may want to reduce the entrance a bit. But the thing is with new beekeepers, they think that the minute there's no new eggs and stuff in there that the queen's dead or she's gone, but she's actually in that process of, you know, hatching, going out and mating, and she may do several mating flights, so just be aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, you know, we've had a couple of questions with that, and the answer is, is be patient and understand that it takes time. And that if you put another queen in there, then you're just ruining the whole natural process that's actually going on. So, yeah, that's um, one of the most common questions that I've been getting um, lately, you know, about how to deal with that. So just be patient and trust that they do know what they're doing and give them a chance to get through that process. Absolutely. Well, should we go into blog recap? Yeah, okay. Blog recap. This is the section of the podcast where we recap 
blogs that we've done or the podcasts in the last month, and we just talk about them a bit. So the number one last month was swarms coming out of our ears. And man, were they coming out of areas at that point. They were just keeping us on our toes, that's for sure. It's slowed down a bit lately, eh, the swarms? Yeah, I think one of the things um, I was talking to someone about today is that because the Queens and the issues are with the weather and the Queens side of things is a bit dodgy, um, swarming may well be a good way to get new colonies um, this season which I wouldn't have said last season. I would have said that you could have done splits easily, but I think that swarming may be a good way to get colonies this year, but you still need to wait till they get brewed before you, you absolutely know that they are healthy. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to, you've got to check them, eh, to make sure they're okay and they've not got AFB or some other disease. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's why we have our quarantine apron. And from there, we... Um, there's some there that we will keep those genetics because they're nice bees to work. And then, yeah, probably next year we, we'll do something with them if they survive through winter. Um, but, yeah, Gary's, uh, you're hopeful for lots of honey this season, eh? Well, yeah, at least a couple of jars. Give, give it out as Christmas presents. Um, <laughs> we, we constantly get hassled by our family to say, oh, you never give us, never give us honey. So we no, must try. We, we we leave it for our girls because they are so important. And this year it was very essential that we did that because they did eat all their honey. That's right. So yeah, that was a good good um, good podcast we did there. So if you want to listen to that one, it's fifty eight. And the next one was Cliff and Eaton, Manuka Honey the Biography. This was an interview I did with Cliff and Eaton, and it was I, I enjoyed that. It was good, good talk. Yeah, it was a great podcast because it it also talked about the history of honey in New Zealand and that was so interesting and it just makes you realise that, um, you know, New Zealand's history is quite young uh, compared to other countries. So, you know, but in terms of honey, there was a lot of things that they were challenged with because New Zealand was absolutely such a different ecosystem and climate compared to, you know, where the bees originated from. Yeah, absolutely. And he's, he's, um, Cliff's actually invited us to an event in Hamilton in the North Island of New Zealand. And that's on Tuesday the 9th of December. So I'll put some details in there. That, that, that's at, um, when is that, 6pm? And it's at the Hamilton Garden Place Library. And it's got a special guest. Can you see the special guest is? Who, who, who? The guy that discovered Manuka is, is um, an amazing honey. Dr. Professor Peter Molan, MBE, he's going to be talking as well. So that should be a great event, Oh, eh? that's awesome. And, and uh, yeah, we'll be very honoured to go. So uh, we're planning yeah. to, to do that. We and hope to, um, if we can get time off work. Well, yeah. I, I can get time off work. <laughs> And um, yeah, we'll try and do that, and that's and, and we've also been offered to record it. So if we can, if that's achievable, we'll try and do that as well. Yeah, and then we'll be bringing that to you guys. So another uh, layer to that whole podcast. Absolutely. But if you're in in the Hamilton area, I'd recommend you go along. And if you uh, yeah, come and join us. Say hi. If you recognise us, come and say hello. It'll Even be awesome. if you don't, just come and say hi. We all got <laughs> something to talk about with this beekeeping thing. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. If not environmental issues. We can talk all night, can't we? Absolutely. So perhaps we should stay the night when that happens, because we'll be driving all night. Sounds like a plan, Stan. Yeah, well, uh, well hopefully we can. That'll and be far out and groovy. <laughs> You're really doing the 60s thing, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, it's the 60s, man. Yeah, I know. Just going to get with it. It's true, it's true. And the third most popular post was Beekeeping 101, Seven Steps to Becoming a Beekeeper. This has become very popular. Must be everyone out there trying to become a beekeeper. That's fantastic. Yeah, there really is an upsurge in um, people wanting to take up beekeeping. We've had um, some small classes that we've been running and they've been, you know, popular. The last one we did, I only had one student. So, yeah, they, uh, they were lucky. That was, you know, really good because it was one-on-one. -on -one, but, you know, I just love it. I just love talking about, you know, what we do here at Kiwi Mana and sharing that. And um, 
you know, helping people get started and know it is achievable. So, you know, Beekeeping 101 is another thing that Kiwimana offer. And, yeah, check out our website for that one. Absolutely. And going back to Cliff, we have the contest for Cliff's book. Yes, Cliff Van Eaton, Manuka Honey, the biography. I've got it in my hand right now. What a wonderful book that, oh, you have to listen. There it is. If this was if this was not audio, you could see it. That's anyway, right. <laughs> they they have kindly given us a free copy, of the publisher, to give away, which we mentioned in the um, in the Cliff Van Eaton interview podcast, and we've had a lot of response to this. So, so, so who will be the lucky who winner is of this the, box? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, baby. We 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 didn't enter ourselves because we, that would be bad. Well, let's. Okay, what we're going to do... It might be a conflict of interest. It's true. <laughs> We've already got one anyway, so that's okay. We bought one, didn't we? Well, let's roll the dice and see who won. Okay, what's that number? do 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 Okay, let's have a drum roll. Let's check this. Yes, this is the right answer. Andreas German. Jermaine from Switzerland. Thank you, Andreas, for entering. And Congratulations. You are the lucky winner of Cliff Van Eaton's Manuka Honey, the biography book. And that will be whisking its way over to you in... Soon. Probably on a plane. In... In soon. Where is he? Where is he from? I just said he's in Switzerland. Oh, in Switzerland. So it'll be yeah. winging its way to you in Switzerland so he's, you can enjoy that. And he's given us his, his, his address, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll send that on to you soon, Andreas. And he also mentions when he sent the contest in, he says, this is a fantastic podcast. Oh, that's lovely. He, he's talking about the um, the last one, I think. And he also said he enjoyed the, the discussion, the Canadian girl about GMOs. Yeah, that was, she's awesome, eh? She is really awesome and she's absolutely onto it, that young lady. It was Rachel Parent. So she, um, that awesome. was on our 58 episode, so thanks thanks to everyone that, that uh, entered the contest and... Yeah. yeah, we'll try and have some more of these in the future. That was good fun, eh? Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and, and you know, it's good reading. That's the other thing. It's it's really good reading. Yeah, and if you can't, um, yeah, if, if you didn't win, just please um, consider buying it, because be there'll be a link on the uh, show notes. Um, you can get it from Amazon now, so you can get it as a Kindle book or a hard book. Awesome. So, yeah, available sure. Available, available now. now, and we hope to uh, meet Cliff one day. We'll be good, or we'll, we'll maybe on the ninth of December. We'll, well do our best. yeah, he said he'll be there, so I guess well, we will. He, he has to be there. He's talking. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's head into the news. Yeah, baby. Kiwimana News, live from the Waitaki Ranges. In West Auckland, on the wild west coast of the North Island of New Zealand. Not too wild tonight, very nice and pleasant. There'll be possums around. Anyway, let's, let's get off that tangent. Now, first article, serious about saving the bees. Time to rethink agriculture. This is a great Ooh. this is a great article with some great ideas to help pollinators. And did you know that fruit and veggies benefit from visits from multiple pollinators? I didn't know that. That's quite cool. I would have thought that if they if they've had the proper pollen but then they'd be fine. Yeah, I think this is an article which talks about necessity of having bees, pollinators like birds and everything and keeping the the trees and the flowers absolutely clear from sprays so you know we all are looking at a bit of convenience which can actually in some contexts be classed as laziness yeah. because instead of digging a weed out you're just spraying it and unfortunately that has big consequences 
Yeah, absolutely. And this is an article from Australia, and they're talking about the almond almond fields in Australia. It's quite interesting that they've got almonds there, eh? Yeah, well, it's good climate for it, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, we talked to when we interviewed Doug from Sydney. He was talking about that as well. And that that's not out yet, but it'll be coming out soon. So that's a good article. So check that one out. And uh, in the this is this is the um, the it quote. It says there is much more to saving the bees in spring flowers and golden and the golden mascot. Don't get me wrong, honey bees have very few faults. Yeah, I agree. And definitely need some TLC, but we shouldn't label one pollinator, pollinator as the one to rule them all. Because she talks about in this article, or he talks about, um, that, you know, we're all saying save the bees, save the bee, which is good. And But they're all saying there's other pollinators out there as well, which, the need, which yeah. also need to be helped. Yeah, and I think that's very true because if you're killing off insects by spraying something that you don't want in your garden, it's only one plant, why don't you just dig it out? Because if you're killing insects, then you're killing birds because birds feed off insects. And then if the birds die, they're not doing pollinating either. And then our whole ecosystem is going to collapse. And she mentions about monocultures, and it's a real dilemma having monocultures because bees and all pollinators and birds need a variety of food. Absolutely. So in one hand, they're creating this monoculture, so they're creating a problem for pests and so on and so forth. And it's these little insects that are really suffering. Yes, indeed. Okay, and the next story is bumblebees create a buzz. Are bumblebees better at pollination work than honeybees? Dr. Peter Padamore from the Plant and Food Research in New Zealand thinks so. And uh, here's the quote. They go, they clumsily bang against our windows and make themselves a springtime nuisance. I don't think so. But the humble bunny bumblebee could prove more valuable to New Zealand's economy than we ever imagined, researchers says. What do you think? Well, it's interesting because these incredible insects, you know, scientists have said, you know, they they shouldn't even be able to fly because they're so big and they're just not aerodynamically designed, you know. No, they're Um, not. Apparently that's true. eh? They're scientifically not aerodynamically built to fly. Yeah, and plus they tend to go out when honeybees wouldn't because they're a bit They've got a bit more um, strength and, and, you know, they're a lot bigger than honeybees anyway. So, yeah, I can understand the ones that we have here in in uh, New Zealand anyway are quite big. So it's interesting. It's an interesting article. Yeah, I mean, I think they, they use them quite a lot in um, in New Zealand in glass houses because they, they, they can put like a box of bumblebees in a glass house and they, will, they won't like... You know, they'll just pollinate the the plants in that glass house. Whereas I think bees would just try and go for the, keep hitting the, the, the window, wouldn't they? So yeah. they must have some different mechanisms. I think that with bee colonies, they, they're, they have a different kind of purpose, don't they? Because they're not as huge. They're quite small. They have um, fewer, you know, offspring. And, yeah, they're just a lot. It's a lot different kettle of fish, I think. Yeah, absolutely. They and you know, the, I think they only go get up to about fifty bees, don't they? Total the the total population, and then over winter, they um, the only one that survives is the queen, and then summer she comes around and tries to find new homes. So, yeah, I, and I don't think you can you can't obviously you can't get honey off them because they hardly produce any, you know, just enough for themselves. So, yeah, I think they just eat it. For their own resource, so they're a different kind of pollinator, aren't they? They they have a focus for themselves and their small colony. And when you're talking about a honeybee, you're talking about fifty five thousand bees in a colony that have to be fed and kept healthy. So yeah, there is there is a lot in that that they are different. So yeah, so that's an interesting article. It is so an interesting article. Check it out. But I still think honeybees are are the best. Anyway, let's move on. I agree. (laughs) Next one is The Beekeeper. This is a short movie and this is about Boulder Beekeeper Tim Broad discusses the value of high quality honey and the importance of maintaining our relationship with the honey bee. This is a short little video that you can watch on the thing. It's only like seven minutes long but it's uh, it's interesting, eh? 
some great there's some great footage there of some uh, bees and there's some cool footage of him actually um, selling his honey at the market. Awesome. I mean, this is worth seeing. It's worth looking into and having a look at, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's um, I think this is this is a few months old, but I think uh, Nick in England sent me a link, link to it, and it's uh, very interesting. So check it out. And look at those awesome bees. They're so gorgeous. There's some great, great camera work here. Eh? Yeah. Oh, there's a drone. Look. But people out there can't hear that, see that. Well, you guys go and have a look at it. You'll really enjoy it. And there's another little video, but this one is from A Legacy of Destruction, Monsanto's Dark History Exposed and Stunning New Photo Essay. This is a very interesting article. Yep, this is a uh, photojournalist called Matthew Isselin, is it? I think he's French. Well, the guy who's presented it is Nick Meyer from allhealthworks.com. And this is a really interesting video. You have to you have to watch it, guys, and it will bring to the fore some of the things we've seen in some of the other movies that we've watched, like uh, Food.Inc, because unfortunately there's a lot of corporate influence in the food chain now, and a lot of governments are tending to support some of these big corporate companies. And... Yeah, if you see what some of these corporate companies and multinationals are doing and how they're selling themselves to the world, it's very, very frightening and very scary for the ordinary farmer to um, stand up against this. these big companies. Absolutely, and the, the blurb about this one is the, um, the Monsanto company has been active for over 100 years now. That's amazing, eh? I didn't realise all that that old, and and yet the St. Louis-based genetically modified seed and chemical giants' long legacy of nephrovigilous actions. This is this is um, from this article, mm-hmm. um, talking about nefarious actions yeah, has that only, they've undertaken. Only recently come into public view. So these articles are all about raising public awareness in terms of what's going to be happening in the future for our food and how food is going to be uh, maybe, in our view, just a few companies running the whole food chain. Yeah, that's it. And, and this, this guy's doing a, he's doing a campaign to, he's, he wants to visit the um, hospitals in Vietnam to look at Agent Orange victims. So he's actually looking for some money to help. So if you've got any money to help support this guy, there's a link there to click and support yeah. his project. And the guy is called Matthew Asselin. Yeah. And you'll see the details for him there. And as Gary said, is there's a link um, to help him in this project. And it's very, very eye-opening about what's going on. Um, all these chemicals, like Gary mentioned, they, they talk about Agent Orange. And um, Roundup, yeah, round all products that Monsanto has created. So, you know, have a look. Have a look at some of these photos and some of the ramifications of these chemical companies and what it is meaning for the individual and to food producers. So Absolutely. So, and then you can send that link to all your friends that buy Roundup. Yeah, send it to gardeners, send it to landscapers, all those people who use chemicals or um, these really far out things that these garden companies are selling to help you manage your land and, and, you know, so they can start to understand what these chemicals are actually doing and, and, you know, for instead of digging a plant out, you just spray it, I mean... If everyone does that, and we've got how many million people in New Zealand? One point five, just in one point five million, just in Auckland. If we all spray a little bit, just imagine the effect. Read this article, have a look at the little video that goes with it, and share it with all your friends. Absolutely. And speaking of uh, multinational companies. Next article is by a guy called Brian Bruce, which is he's a he's one of, he's quite a good he's a TV presenter here, and he does like a lot of documentaries and 
he did a series called The Investigator, eh? That was quite interesting, he, where he investigated old crimes and stuff. Anyway, this is about a rundown about the TPPA agreed... And agreement, sorry, and the trans- this is the Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is uh, should concern people in New Zealand and people anywhere in the Pacific. So it includes America, Asian countries, yeah, everywhere, really, the, everyone, everyone that's connected to the Pacific. And he just talks about the um, the things in the agreement, like things like the cost of drugs might go up for prescription drugs, and you know the fact that the overseas corporations can actually sue the New Zealand government. Um, and the problem with, with this, I think, is that they're not actually telling anybody what's in it. And the, the, the problem is, it's gonna, once they've agreed with it, is there going to be enough time to debate it? And will the public get a chance to um, reject it? Or is it just going to be approved because the government knows best? I think that's the very key question. And, and from what I can see is that... Um in my view, the current government is pushing through a lot of corporate agendas, which is all about money, and it's not about Kiwis or the local population. And this is just about corporates being in charge and not the government being in charge. And by joining up this kind of agreement, we are losing control of how we determine our future. And it's it's already prevalent in some of the policies that have been approved in terms of food and everything. Everything is just highly regulated now. It's becoming worse. We're getting a lot more spying, which is being justified by fear and terrorism. So I think the government, in my view, is just, just starting to be quite draconian and forcing us into places where we shouldn't as a, a small country agree to you know we it's almost feels like we're getting bullied and the government saying well this is right for you and I don't agree it's not right for us we need to determine ourselves not be bullied by corporates to achieve their financial goals and other countries financial or political goals so Absolutely. And this was, just makes me so angry. I know. In the last podcast we talked about, there was actually a protest match in Auckland, wasn't there, which was great that it got some media coverage. Yeah, and that was uh, good. Fortunately, fortunately love, we uh, couldn't make it because that was the day we got struck down with this <laughs> illness. Yeah, and plus we had a incident across the road from us where um, one of our neighbours was murdered. So we had all these things going on and then it just, you know, this TPPA, it was really an interesting thing. We aren't having a say. If the government really um, was working for us, they would allow us to have some input and we would be able to read exactly what this policy is going to do and they are just not being transparent. And I love on this article... It actually talks about the comparison of big tobacco companies forcing, you know, their their agenda. Oh yeah, they can sue people, eh? Like I think in Australia, the the big big tobacco companies are trying to sue the Australian government because of the um, you know the they're making, bringing cigarettes out with clear packaging, aren't they? So they're getting sued for that. Yeah, and I think that that is just saying that they are telling our governments what to do. And there's a lot of difference between having a, a an agreement with someone who you're both benefiting from this. This is not what I see as being benefit. And I like this what this guy Brian is saying in this article, that it is a country is not a corporate. It has a head of state, not a CEO. So we in New Zealand have our Prime Minister. The prime object of a corporation is to make a profit for a limited group of shareholders. So he also goes on to say, a country is more like a family business where we work to look after each other by sharing the nation's profit. This profit is not going to benefit us in the sense of the whole country. 
it's only going to really benefit those people who own that corporate. So he says the very last comment is, I want to live in a country, not a corporation. So where can we view our opposition? Well, they did a march and it was quite successful, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean, I think what they could do is an idea. Once this has been agreed with all, all the, you know, all the, the parts of it, it actually gets displayed to all the public and then we have a referendum about it. Yes or no? Maybe that's a good idea. Generally what most local governments do is that they put the policy out there and then they ask for a public consultation. But what our what our Prime Minister is saying, you know, you don't have a right to talk about it because we've been voted in And those people are the ones who want what we want and they have made the decision by voting us in. So if you didn't vote, you are part of the majority that did not support this this government coming in. Mm. So anyway, moving along, that's very political and those are my views. Absolutely. So if you're in New Zealand or in the Pacific, have a look at that because uh, it concerns you. This is another, this is one article that we've got here that I really want to go into. And this is where we want to say thank you to the Ministry for Primary Industries. Oh, you, you're jumping ahead, darling. I know. Oh, okay. That's coming up. <laughs> Gary is just, conf- I've just confused him. <laughs> We're sticking to the show notes. I just led nicely into it, but never mind that. Anyway, (laughs) I'm going to go into it. We are just saying that congratulations to the Ministry for Primary Industries um, for sending home a Ukrainian couple for allegedly, well, I don't know why it's allegedly, because they definitely had the stuff on them, um, trying to smuggle honey and pollen into New Zealand. Yeah, this is. They this is some, sent them home. They sent them packing. Well done. That's awesome. Yeah, that is great. And it talks about Tauranga Beekeeper. That was from Mossop Honey. Yes, it's a message from Tauranga Beekeeper Neil Mossop, who says that the honey and pollen were found is good news, and sending them home shows that we won't tolerate that kind of action. And the. The thing that is so amazing about this story is that that couple were going to work for a beekeeping company. You would think they'd know, wouldn't you? You'd think that that beekeeping company would have explained to them the risks and that they can't do that. It just makes no sense to me at all. No, I I agree. and I We yeah. have to really protect our honey industry because it, it's such a you know a quality product and bringing in all this stuff secretly or whatever is just going to be create I just can't understand it it's just going to create such an issue and if we get any of those um, other diseases you know it's it's just going to really jeopardize our whole industry Absolutely. So if, if you're coming to New Zealand, we, we'd love to see you, but please leave your honey and bee products at home. Yeah, and, make um, sure your your boots you haven't been in an apiary too and make sure they're all nicely clean. Don't bring any clothing that's got pollen on it or anything like that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And we, so. get, we get a lot of inquir- a lot of pe- our, our listeners and people, they... They say, oh, we can send you some of our honey, but, but ple- and we'd really like that, but please don't, because they will get in trouble. Yeah, and I think that... We'll the, come and visit you one day. Yeah, to send us a ticket and we'll come over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's, um, I just think that's awesome, and it just means that, you know, it matters. It matters. Our industry matters, and we need to look after it. Absolutely. And let's move on to how do honeybees smell? This is a fantastic article from Karen Bean about how bee- how honeybees smell. And we actually interviewed Karen, didn't we, a long time ago? Remember that? Yeah, yeah. And I didn't know that bees smell with their legs. Did you know that? It's all the hairy stuff. 
teary oh, they're, stuff. They're amazing things, and apparently they can even smell something when they're flying quite high up. So that's how. That, that, if you ever, if you've ever like accidentally left a honey super out without closing it up, you'll notice that you you'll notice bees come along quite quickly. This is how they do it. They can smell. So this. It looks like it says in the article that it's a tiny hair-shaped organ that incorporate receptor nerve cells. So it's it's very very um, developed sense of smell and survival. Because you know, let's face it, if they don't didn't have this, how would they have been surviving? Well, that's it. They try and smell the uh, nectar and the flowers, don't they? And it says here, scent, this is Karen Wright, scent means a lot to bees. They use their sense of smell to check for, for queen quality, sort out friend from foe, locate their hive or a new hive after swarming, and find forage. Their scents are so acute that they can catch a scent while in flight. And I encourage you to listen, have a look at this article. It's really good. Yeah, so Karen, it is. It's Karen, really good. So she's, she's really good at explaining um, complicated things. Hmm. That's probably her, um, I think she used to be a biologist or something. Yes, it's interesting. We do, as humans, create a lot of issues in this environmental world, don't we? You know, and uh, the, one of the things I remember the old beekeepers used to say, you know, most of them say, don't wear any smell when you go into the apiary. And the reason for that is a lot of perfumes or deodorants have got musk and all sorts of things that basically are tricking the bees because they'll smell it and there's nothing there so you know you can create a bit of uh it's kind of like they get a bit agitated because you've got the scent on so it's best to keep yourself scent free basically when you go and just be natural Absolutely, yeah, because the, and that's what um, you know when you're using a smoker, that's what that does, doesn't it? It masks the alarm pheromones and you know makes them. So it it it's really breaks their communication way. So yeah, no, that's it's it's a great article. So I encourage you to look at that. And it's got some. There's it, even like bees that have been trained to sniff out bombs. Yeah, and disease. Yeah, like they can um they can sniff out cancer and stuff. Interesting. Oh, they they did some studies on dogs doing that too, and that they managed to pick out cancer. Oh, okay. In humans. Oh, cool. But this so, is this yeah, is a beekeeping podcast, not a dog podcast. I know, but it just shows you how <laughs> awesome our oh, natural think, world is. I think dogs are amazing as well, but that's a different podcast. Yeah, no, they are amazing. And the next one... We're all connected, Gary. Yeah, I know. We're all connected to the dogs and the fruit and the trees and the flowers and the earth. Is this, you're going back to the 60s. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, would it be an interesting time to live, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's like time of free everything, wasn't it? Apparently. Except, <laughs> it, it, it would have been good except for Vietnam. But anyway, let's move well, on. Well, yeah, we can go back to Monsanto about that. Yeah. Anyway, what's anyway. the next one? Bee Swarm Disrupts Hastings Drivers. This is Hastings in New Zealand, which is a smallish town, and a swarm, a swarm somewhere right there, was it fix that? A swarm of bees to, took up residence at the Hastings intersection and fun ensured. I, just... I think the best quote... <laughs> What? No, just go go for it. This, go this, for the it. best quote in this article was, No petitions were harmed by the bees, but a lady on a mobility scuba, scooter at the lights looked frustrated. <laughs> wow, she that's... probably just wanted to get on with her day. Well, if, she, if she moved in slowly, she would have been fine. Wow, absolutely. And we all know that um, when bees swarm, they're actually quite calm. You know, I mean, any animal's going to sting you if you try and squash it. But when they're swarming, they're looking for a new house, so they're not going to be guarding a hive. So generally, they're pretty calm. They're happy to find a place to go and stay. So, you know, welcome them with open arms and get your new hive gear ready. Absolutely. And unfortunately, sometimes they find new places to live and they're in people's houses because we visited an old couple the other day, didn't we? And they, yeah. the bees were living in their wall, but they've... There was a you went back and fixed it, didn't you? Yeah, basically what happened is um we've had a couple of uh calls. One was a 
going to be a cutout. But once we once I got there and I had a look in there, the bees had actually been uh, had left. They had absconded, and I think they just ran out of space. And yeah, there was a bit of robbery in there, but um, yeah, they were gone. So that was a non-event. And then we had another one, which you were saying about this older couple. And we went there last year and we collected um, a swarm off them, which when we took it back here to the quarantine apiary, it re-swarmed again. So we got two colonies out of that swarm, which have proven to be awesome bees. So um, apparently a, a guy had seen the swarm flying up the road so he followed it and it ended up at this older couple's house and uh, oh they must they must like that house yeah it's exactly the same place and um but they ha- had actually moved on because i think they decided that the hole in the wall was just too small because it was a huge huge swarm so but we put some mesh we gave them some mesh to put in the um little cavities so hopefully they don't <coughs> excuse me Hopefully they don't get another swarm coming in there. So, but, yeah, it's a bit of a shame we didn't catch that one too. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, no, that's, uh, it is a shame, but it was uh, good that they've gone somewhere else for that yeah, lovely couple. I'm sure that um, someone will be very happy with them because they are awesome bees if they're from the same genetics. I suspect they would be. Indeed. Well, let's move on to questions from you. Well, this week or this month, we had a question from Dave. He's considering setting up his own beehive for a while, and he's it's one of his dreams, apparently, whilst he's building our new the new home. But he really doesn't have much of a clue where to start, where to, where to obtain bees, what kind of hive is best. How do we look after them and treat any diseases? Phew, that's a that's question. huge question. We could write a book about this, those three questions. Yeah. And what are the running costs of keeping a hive and what things do we need to avoid? Well, the first thing you need to avoid is asking too many questions all at once. <laughs> okay, so basically I think you need He's to... He's keen. Oh, yeah, I know. I get it, I get it, I get it, I do. And I think that that is exciting. So if you really just want to get going, the first thing you need to do is get yourself on a swarm list at your local beekeeping club. And then from there, organise some getting your gear and have it all ready. Do you think that swarms are a good idea for beginners? But seriously, because I I think it's a steep learning curve. It is a steep learning curve. I mean, one example is, is that we had... A beginner capture swarms, but then they get all the gear and then they put it in the box and then the swarm leaves. <laughs> so yeah, there are think... risks involved. We we don't go down that road for beginners, do we? No, and I, I to be honest, I think if you've got someone a huge swarm and they're just beginners, then suddenly they've gone from no bees to like a massive four box hive or something. I just think that would be overwhelming. So yeah, maybe well, maybe it's better if they 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 work with a nuke and grow it and let it build up and well then there's controversy with that too and that's one of the reasons why we decided that we would set up beginner kits where um, beginners could buy a fully working hive so basically they can they don't have to grow it so there's no risk involved with them failing over winter. So they'll get a hive that's got resources there and that they get two boxes with the opportunity to grow some more honey after the they've taken the honey off before the end of the year. They leave the honey on for their first season. So our view is to get a fully working hive that has got, you know, about five or six honey frames when you get it and you know the queen is working so you don't have to wait for her and there's no risk of perhaps interfering with her mating or anything like that and you can just start working your hive and get to know your hive get it through winter and then the next season is when you can start exploring things like swarm 
handling swarms, doing splits, yeah, doing honey extractions, starting to learn what's going on in the cell. So that's our view, and that's what we do here. We we provide beginner kits, which are two full depth boxes, yeah. or if you want to go to three quarters, just for an ease of management. Um, we do three three quarters to get you started. So our view is to start with a fully working hive. Absolutely, and I think basic tools to start off with, this is what I, I've written down. I've written, I'm, I might actually make this a blog post. I'm still working on it, but, but it's a good hive tool, using it for cleaning frames. A smoker, that's really good eh, to calm the bees and mask any alarm pheromones. And I... I I reckon a veil. Do you, what do you reckon? I reckon at least everyone should have a veil so they can protect their face from bee stings. And, you know, and these come in various forms. You can just get the veil if you're brave. You can get a full suit, or you can just get like the jacket one. So that's I think they're the three well I, basic stuff. I think from my perspective is I would buy a beginner kit because I remember that when we first started out, we bought nukes. And it does take time for them to build up. And sometimes I think that's a real delicate, you know, a real delicate process. And I really think that they need the resources. So nukes are good um, to a certain degree, but you still have to be patient for them to build up. You can't just get a nuke and then expect to take all the honey off because oh, no, a I lot of them no. will fail. This, this is just the tools we... Yeah, I understand that, but to manage a hive, I believe that you need a good hive tool, which is the Kiwi hive tool, which has got all the things that you need. You don't need two hive tools to do one thing and the other one to do the other. This Kiwi hive tool will give you what you need. A frame holder, because when you you are working the hive, you don't need to put the frames on the ground, so you could crush your bees or your queen. So having a frame holder that you can put on the side of the box is really handy. A bee brush is really handy. Not a brush and pan brush, a bee brush, because a bee brush is very soft, doesn't hurt the bees and doesn't damage their wings. Yeah, and it's got a single row of hair, isn't it? Like yeah, it's as very, to a... very soft. And you're not actually brushing them like a brush. You're actually just placing it on top of the bees to move them along. So I believe a, a hive tool, the Kiwi hive tool, I think is awesome. A brush, a frame holder... Smoker. A smoker and a bee suit, whether it be a half a suit or a full suit. Yeah, I yeah. think I think it. I think having a suit builds confidence, and I yeah, think as definitely as you get more experience and you get more confident, you may may not use it all the time, but I don't know. You just got to get stung once on the top of your nose, and you'll realise how. Yeah, good they are. and you know you don't want to. I I my personal thing is not to have my eyes exposed. So I'm a real firm believer in being fully confident, wearing a full suit. I've got my gum boots on. I've got my the the legs of the hive suit over my gum boots, gloves. You know, get the right kind of gloves. We um, use goat skin gloves. They're a lot softer, easier to work. They last really well too, which is awesome. So, you know, those are the kind of things. And one more thing is a capping scratcher. They are so handy because you can, if you're looking at new season, you can prick the top of the uh, capped honey for the new bees and they can feed off it. You use it for doing your management of, you know, the oh, rower. Yeah, yeah, extract- yeah, so, you know, there's, those are the sort of things that I would recommend. Absolutely. And, and the, the basic hive, for someone that's a complete beginner, I'll just go through what, what we, what we what I, you know, this, this is the basic stuff. You've got, first of all, you've got a baseboard. This is the bottom of the hive. This is where the bees come in and out. And then you've got boxes, and these are full of frames, generally 10, um, but you can buy 8 frames and stuff, not, not, not from us. Don't make it complicated. Okay, box full of frames, this is, and this is used by the bees to store and raise their babies and store honey, 
And then you've got a hive mat or an inner cover, which is goes below the tin roof or the roof at the top, which is sheet metal, not really tin, but I just keep calling it that. And then the roof is like to, designed to propel water. So that's that's the basics of a hive, eh? You mean repel water? Repel. Yeah, because basically what happens is that the the way that we do it is you get a solid bottom board for your first season. The solid bottom board has um, a little landing area out the front, which the bees land on, and then the bees walk in from there. Then you've got your first box, which is your brood box, generally, and then your second box is generally your honey box, and that's the box that you want to fill up with honey as much as you can over your first season. Then you have, as Gary said, the hive mat, which is designed to stop condensation because if you just put the metal lid on top of them, they would get a lot of condensation and the hive would be soaked. So that's why you need a hive mat. And yeah, and, yeah. It, and it gives you a bit of bee space above the frames too. Yeah, and so generally it's 10 frames in each box and the type of hive which is most common here in New Zealand is the Langstroth uh, method. With Hoffman frames, absolutely. So thanks, Dave, for your question, and we might we, we may do a blog post about this. So I'll, I'll, I will email you the answer to. Well, you can come in to do our course, and I can go over the very basics to get you started. Yep, absolutely. If you're in the Auckland area, that would be that would be cool. Well, I wouldn't stop anyone coming from Australia to do the course. <laughs> well, I wouldn't either. But you know, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, as long as you can make it to uh, Auckland and Massey, absolutely. Join Margaret's course. We just, we just, uh, at the moment, we're actually just taking people adding to the waiting list. And once we've got a few people, we will, we will book the next one. Yeah, and we're doing some courses through the community education um, at the start oh, when do of they next start? year. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's happening. Watch this space, guys. And you're still going to do the practical day for the other courses, eh? We're going to wait yeah, till the sun comes out. Yeah, we've had such bad weather that the apiary has been too messy and I, it, the wind has been horrific. So I've not been happy or confident to open a hive while that weather's going on. So we still have an apiary visit, which we need to um, put together. And, yeah, we hope that will be happening in the next few weeks. Absolutely. Let's move on to blog post coming soon. Okay, so this is a section where we have blog posts coming soon. Have you got any plans for any blog posts, Margaret? No, I've had um, the blooming in Kiwimana, what's blooming in Kiwimana, sitting there as a draft. It's I've just had no time to get it done. Oh, okay. Well, well that might come out. You never know. You never know your luck. <laughs> Well, we've got some good interviews coming up. We've got uh, Doug Purdy from Sydney in Australia. We've got Tom Farabold. We've got Randy Oliver, Solomon Park, and also Julian. Yes. All coming out soon. It's, Gary's been working very hard and putting these together, so well done you. Thank you. We'll probably try and maybe we'll release those over the uh, Christmas time so you can you can listen to those while you're on your uh, at, the, at the beach. And listen and learn while you're sitting on the beach. Yeah, and um, thank you to all our customers that have, you know, given us feedback about these podcasts and what it means to them and how, you know, they have learned so much about beekeeping from all over the world. And a lot of the environmental um, interviews that you've done have really created quite a buzz. And uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, this is just to create awareness about these little things that we do um, can really make big impact. So we want to keep saving bees and we want to encourage people to keep bees because I think that's the way that we're going to save, you know, save absolutely. them. Yeah, absolutely. And I really believe that urban beekeeping um, is proving very good to help save the bees you know the, I admire the urban beekeepers that are managing hives and their passions for it so it's well done you guys and, and keep up the good work yep 
for sure. Now, feedback from you guys. I haven't got any new iTunes reviews this month, so if, if, you, if you're if you on iTunes, it'd be great if you could leave us a, a review. That'd be fantastic. We've got a message from Martin, and I think he's in England, and he says, he says, I'm exploring the world of podcasts, and I've been listening to yours. Brill is the word. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Martin. That's awesome. Oh, that's fantastic! And you know, thanks for taking time out to to give us that feedback. It's it's just awesome, and we get so much uh, responses coming through, and it's it's just been awesome. And we apologise if we hadn't been quicker responding in the last couple of weeks, but um, yeah, we're 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 getting back into it. So um, yeah, thank you for your patience, guys. Absolutely, and and for people out there, our website is kiwimanaco.nz and you can email us at info at kiwimanaco.nz or nz as Americans say, I've NZ, been told. Nz, yes. Okay, well, let's just have a musical break and we'll come back and talk about our newsletter. That's a short one. That's a good one. Anyway, we have a newsletter and we would love it if you guys joined it because we um, have a lot of people on there and we get a lot of good feedback from people. These people people love it and they uh, we put beekeeping tips and news and we also tell you about blog posts and podcasts that we're releasing. So if you want to join that, it's kiwimana, cut it and Z slash sign up and we, uh, we must get some of the people the comments that love the newsletter and make a little page, you know, so they can... People can see what it's like. But, uh, yeah, sign up and have a look and uh, see what you think. It'd be awesome. And that's pretty much it for me. There's no extra, there's no after hours bonus this week. But, uh, well, yeah. this month it'll be fantastic if you can tell one of your tell one of your friends about our podcast too. Tell all your beekeeping or gardening friends that we Yeah, fantastic. absolutely. That'd be cool. So have you got anything else to say this month, Margaret? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, we're now in the swing in 60s and we hope that you enjoy the podcast that we put out today and you find something invaluable. And just a little note on the end of that. Yeah, baby! <laughs> so, is it enjoy! I think I know what that is. Okay. If you know who that is, <laughs> drop us a line. Send Margaret an email. Yep, absolutely. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for listening. We've really enjoyed uh, talking to you today, and we'll see you next time. See ya. And Merry Christmas. Yay. Yay.